Okay, so here's the second part of the Mel Torme Maureen McGovern tour. Uh, the end of January to the middle of March of 1992. And here's what I posted. Uh, this is April 24th, 2020. I posted this on April 6th on my Facebook profile. And here it is. One la- one, this is what it says here. One last story for a little while, and it's a doozy and stress-filled at the time anyway. Uh, grab a coffee. Hmm, coffee. Could please snag one me too? One for me too? Okay, here it goes. Lots of stuff going on with this one. Sorry about the length, but it took this long to get it all down. Now, I make reference to having Phil Woods up here uh, playing with him and backing him up in a big band and so on and so forth. I have a story about Phil coming up later, but um, this is one of the things I'm adding uh, just as an aside to this particular posting. When Phil Woods was up here and playing Hanging Out, I picked up two great quotes from him. The first one was, remember, fly first class and play economy. And the second, the other one was, you pay me to get to and from the gig, I play for free. Well, if that second quote has any truth to it, I should have made amazing money for this tour. January 1992. I had canceled the classes I had registered for at university to go on the road with Mel Torme and Maureen McGovern. And then after that, to do three months on my first cruise ship contract, I have mentioned that stuff in a previous posting. I was told to just come on down. Don't worry about the paperwork. We need you down here to start rehearsing. I was reluctant as I had always had a letter of employment as well as a J-1 visa. I believe it was back then. I believe it's a P-2 now, P-2 visa. Processed through the Musicians Union office in Toronto. I decided rather reluctantly that I would just go to the airport as I just wanted to get on with it, which was a mistake. I got to the airport. Everything seemed fine. I got to U.S. Customs. Again, everything seemed fine. Until the customs officer pulled me aside and asked me to wait and took all my luggage to a separate room. In the deep, dark depths of one of my bags, he found my tour schedule and itinerary, came back and told me that I am missing key paperwork, which of course I knew, and told me that he could not admit me into the country until I had it, and sent me back out into the concourse. So, after watching my flight take off, I immediately called Joe Graydon, the main contractor, down in Los Angeles, and told him that I had been booked on the same flight tomorrow, so I was going to miss the first rehearsal later that day, and that I need a letter of employment from him as quickly as humanly possible, which needed to be drafted up and faxed to the Musician Union Office in Calgary, which would then be faxed to the Union Office in Toronto, and fully processed. Just so you're aware of how much bureaucratic red tape there is now and flaming hoops that you have to jump through now to get this processed, that letter of employment was sent to Calgary from L.A. All of that paperwork was faxed to Toronto. The visa was printed and processed and sent back by FedEx to Calgary, which I picked up on the way to the airport the next morning. Grand total cost, 35 bucks. Now to get a visa to go across the border as a touring musician, I believe the wait is 60 to 90 days for processing. And the cost is multiple, multiple hundreds of dollars. If you're traveling as a group, many thousands of dollars. It has truly gotten, gotten ridiculous with a capital R. And that's no word of a lie. I've researched some of that stuff in the not too distant past. And it's pretty, it's pretty over the top. It's just, it's a cash grab now. So there I was at the airport with all the paperwork I needed, getting through U.S. Customs relatively seamlessly. The flight that I was booked on was a bit of a milk run via United Airlines. Calgary, Spokane, Spokane to San Francisco, San Francisco to LAX. From there, I was to hop a super shuttle van from LAX, which is in Inglewood, to a building called the Horace Height Apartments in the San Fernando Valley, about a 45-minute drive in decent traffic. This was where we were rehearsing as a band with Mel and Maureen. I was playing Barry sax and some bass clarinet on this tour. So after we landed, I proceeded to the luggage carousel to retrieve my stuff. My luggage came down the conveyor, my bass clarinet came through oversized baggage, and I continued to wait for my berry sacks to arrive. When I got to the point where I was almost the only guy left around the carousel, the carousel had stopped and all I could hear were crickets, I knew there was a problem. I walked over to the luggage desk for United, showed them my baggage tag, and asked them 
where this piece of luggage would be located at this moment. I was then told that there were numerous flights per day going between San Francisco and LAX, and that my Barry Sachs was on the next United shuttle from San Francisco, which was to land in about 45 minutes. And then I interjected a palm slap there. I had rented a car from Budget, which I was to pick up before going to rehearsal, but... Okay, my phone's making noises again. But now because of this delay with my horn, I was going to have to go straight to the rehearsal and go to the rental car the next day to get my car. Another hiccup to deal with later. My Barry Sachs finally arrived. I hopped in the super shuttle and headed towards the San Fernando Valley. When I got there, the rehearsal had already started and they had another guy, Bob Carr, sitting in for me until I arrived. As a side note, I remember listening to a recording of the Bob Florence Big Band out of L.A., Los Angeles, that I own. And I noticed that Bob Carr was playing Barry Sachs on that recording, so it was pretty cool to meet him, actually. I thanked him profusely for holding it down until I got there. I got my horn together, and it was just happy. I was just happy to finally be there. I joined in on whatever chart they were doing and began playing my part. Now, the next paragraph is a little bit of Sachs geek talk, so please bear with me on this. As I'm running through these charts, I quickly notice that I can't play anything from low E flat down to low A. So on a stoppage, I pick up my horn and I look at it, and I see that the post where the low E flat key sits has been bashed in and the soldering has come off. As well, the bell has shifted and and my alignment from low C down to low A is completely screwed. Needless to say, I had to transfer a lot of what I was playing up an octave to make it work. And I let them know that the horn was damaged and I will look at, it getting, look at getting it fixed before our first concert. Yet another hiccup in a series of hiccups so far. I had a great ally with me down in L.A. at that time. Someone who I'm very privileged to call a good friend and mentor, trumpeter Bobby Shue. Bobby had set it up so that I could stay with one of his students at his condo in Granada Hills, which is on the north end of the San Fernando Valley while we were doing our gigs in the LA area. I bummed a ride with one of the tenor players. His name was Greg Degler, and he was an ex uh, Harry James band and Tommy Dorsey band member, I believe. And the funny thing about him was when America's Funniest Home Videos first started, the very first incarnation of that show, there was, during the theme, there was a a big tenor solo that... uh, that happened on the theme. And apparently that was Greg that, that was, uh, got the call to play that. Anyway, the guy that Bobby Shue had contacted me about staying at his place was a trumpeter by the name of George Baker, who was an exterminator by day. George was in the trumpet section of Woody Herman's band when they recorded the very last album before Woody passed away called Woody's Gold Star. Greg dropped me off at George's condo and I went inside, got settled. And the first two things I did was call United Airlines and then Bobby Shue. United told me that I would have to come back to LAX and fill out paperwork, a 45-minute drive in good traffic. And I didn't have a car at my disposal anyway. Thanks for making it easy for me, United. Much appreciated. Expletive, expletive. I called Bobby Shue and told him what had happened and that the next day I had a day off, so I needed to find a repair guy. And could he recommend somebody around where I was staying? He told me to call a gentleman by the name of Reuben Allen, who was the owner of a place called The Sack Shop on Magnolia Boulevard in North Hollywood. I'd remembered going there to take a look around a year or so prior while on a previous tour. I believe it was the, the, um, it was the Dorsey tour where uh, we went to The Sack Shop. I took a quick look around there. Bobby gave me Reuben's home number and said to tell him that I that he told me to call. I called him. He answered somewhat suspiciously. And I remember that. I remember saying, hi, is this Ruben? And I would hear, yeah. Uh, And I had to explain to him that Bobby Shue called. It was kind of like, yeah, it was, he was very suspicious about who getting a call from somebody he didn't know. Anyway, I called him. He answered somewhat suspiciously. I, I told him, Bobby told me to phone him and then explain the situation. He said to bring the horn by mid to late morning and I told him I would right after I picked up my rental car. I finally had a few minutes to decompress, some peace of mind, and was able to chill out and not be worried about anything at that moment. It was the first time in many, many hours that I was able to do that. 
The next morning, George dropped me off to get my rental car at budget, and I headed to the sack shop in North Hollywood to get this damage dealt with. When I got there, I introduced myself to Reuben, told him what I found, and asked him to take a look at it for me and to just get it back in working order. He said okay and to leave it with him for the next few hours and to give him a call later in the afternoon. I then went back to George Baker's condo as he had gone to do his exterminator thing. About mid-afternoon, I gave Reuben a call and he told me that the horn was done and to come pick it up anytime I was free. I told him I was on my way. When I got there, I asked him about what he had found, and he began to list off about a half a dozen or more things. And every time he mentioned something, in my mind, I could feel and see my first week's pay quickly slipping through my hands. After he had listed off of, off the various things that he had done, I asked him, okay, what do I owe you? And I braced myself for the answer. His reply was, eh, 40 bucks. I stood there for a moment in silence looking at him and I said something along the lines of, uh, excuse me, what? He again told me 40 bucks. And that was probably the closest I'd ever been and ever will be to kissing another man. I couldn't believe it. So I said to him that if he was only going to charge me 40 bucks, I'm going to buy a bunch of other stuff in his store. There was far more than $40 worth of work done on that horn. I know it for a fact. I think when all was said and done, I'd spend about $150 in his store before leaving, including the repair. I saw Reuben again many years later working at the Julius Calworth booth. That's a, a brand of saxes I used to endorse for, made in Germany. Um, I saw Reuben again many years later working at the Julius Calworth booth at one of the jazz educator conferences, fixing instruments and doing adjustments. I introduced myself to him again, and I said to him, I'm sure you probably don't remember me, but I will never forget you and what you did for me. I then told him that story of me bringing my berry sacks to his shop. After I got back to the condo, George Baker asked me if I had any plans for that night, and I said no. I've got nothing until tomorrow night, which was our first concert for this tour. He then told me that a buddy of his, who was also a trumpet player, named John Pappenbrook, had called him to say there was a blues jam at a club called the Roxy in Hollywood and that they were going to go to it. George told me that John played trumpet in Rod Stewart's horn section and they had some downtime now in between gigs and tours and he was looking to hang. I was happy to go and check it out. When we got to the Roxy, we walked in and George informed me that the guy that was running the jam was the sax player on stage and he was a good friend of both of them. I, w I was watching him when we walked in and I saw him holding up one finger, then four fingers, and then five fingers, etc. His face turning red and shaking his head and then looking really pissed off. We heard about two songs before they decided to take a break. And when they came off stage, the sax player immediately walked over to where we were standing, shaking his head and many expletives were flying. <laughs> George asked him what the problem was, to which he replied... John Entwistle, who's the bassist from the British rock band The Who, is sitting in with us on bass, and he is so effing high right now, he can't even navigate a simple effing 145 blues. He must have heard his name or something, because like clockwork, right after that, John Entwistle came over to where we were standing to introduce himself. He said hello to me, shook my hand with a big smile, and kind of swayed back and forth a little bit. A very nice guy, and yes, his eyes were about as glassy as the screen you're looking into right now. That was a cool moment. From there on in, things got back on track, and the tour went very well. Partway through our time in Los Angeles at one of our gigs, a small handful of the cast of Night Court showed up to our concert and hung out backstage with Mel, Maureen, and the band. Those of you that remember the show may recall that Mel made some cameo appearances on the show, as he was the main character's favorite singer. Was it Judge Harry Stone, I think? It was his, the character's name. I don't remember all the characters' names as I only watch the show from time to time, but I do remember their real names. And I remember meeting John Larroquette, Marsha Warfield, Richard Mall, and Marky Post backstage. And that was pretty cool. So then I posted... <laughs> actually, I say, can I just say that if you read this post all the way through to hear without falling asleep. You are a rock star. Well done and thank you. Uh, and I did post another track. It was a track that 
with Maureen and Mel singing together. And I believe it was prior to our tour because Maureen's got big hair in this video and she didn't on our tour. And I think it was a bit before that, probably late eighties. Anyway, so that's the main thing with that. Um, fair amount of drama to start that off. So, and I see that this is the longest video I've made so far. So there was a lot of information there that, uh, that, um, a lot of stuff happened and, uh, yeah, to have lived it. I mean, it's one thing to just write it down. It's documented like that, but to have lived all of that was pretty crazy and getting around the whole Los Angeles and Southern California area in a rental car with no GPS and just a map and making notes the night before. <laughs> so anyway, I live to tell about it. So woohoo, good for me. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's that tour. That was a lot of fun. And I still maintain contact with a few people from that tour too, which is great. So anyway, um, yeah, as I say at the end of all of these videos, I have a, an email address set up, youtube at belltones.ca, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E at B-E-L-L-T-O-N-E-S dot C-A. That if you have any questions, comments, suggestions of topics, just want to say hi, feel free to send them there. I will respond to you. Don't worry. It doesn't go into a, you know, to somebody else that never gets back to you. Just don't spam me. Don't do it. I don't need it. Thank you. Uh, but anyway, that's it for now. Hope you all are doing well and, uh, we'll catch you soon.